Well, I'm, I'm Billy Cifredi, the, uh, the founder of Cifredi and Associates. And so this is um, uh, the great city of uh, Quebec City. I was just recently at the, Ameri the International Federation of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapists. It's not often in um, on this continent, so it was great to be able to go up there um, a couple weekends ago and hear some of the top people in the, in the world um, about our profession. And a little side street there. If you've never been there, I've never been there until last a couple weeks ago. It's um, just a beautiful place. So a tennis elbow, not just for athletes, not just for tennis players. Um, when you look at Wikipedia, uh, um, the name comes from an irritation of the muscles on the outside of the elbow that are used with the backhand stroke in tennis. And that was the term was uh, coined back in 1883 by H.P. Major in a paper, Lawn Tennis Elbow. And it was, I think, in the British Journal of Medicine. And so, backside of the elbow, and that's where it came from. Um, epidemiology, it's just this one study back in 79, it just um, points out in particular that um, of all these folks, when you're over 50, there's a lot more people in the percentage that describe this problem as severe and disabling. And that's certainly our um, observation here when we see folks, a lot of the times the folks we see are, um, they're really disabled by this thing by the time they get around the scene. Um, online, the Mayo Clinic, uh, as the name suggests, playing tennis, um, especially repeated use of the backhand stroke with poor technique is one possible cause. Um, however, uh, common, other common motions that other people do uh, get labeled as tennis elbow as well. So it's a very generic term that's used for pain on the outside of the elbow. So people who might use plumbing tools, painting, Screw driving, um, cooking, computing um, are all people that fall into this category that get labeled with tennis elbow. So the symptoms of tennis elbow are simply pain or dull ache, usually on the outside of the elbow, and that's what you get when you get labeled for tennis elbow. Um, it can also feel weak. So the cause is considered overuse. Excessive strain can cause irritation or micro tears is the, the thought process um, in the basic tendonitis of tennis elbow <coughs> that you irritate the tissue and it pulls it apart a little bit and creates micro tears and inflammation can result. <coughs> Overuse, question mark. Um, if you're in our clinic, you'll know that a lot of people and maybe some folks in the audience or people you know have tennis elbow, but they don't have any story of playing tennis, or they don't have any story of, I didn't do anything recently that I really did a lot of something to overuse it. It just showed up. So what's that all about? And hopefully we can speak to that a little bit here as well. So again, a study from the uh, Journal of uh, Shoulder and Elbow Surgery indicated while it's commonly stated that lateral epicondylitis, which is the formal name for tennis elbow, is caused by repetitive microtrauma or overuse, this is a speculative etiology theory with limited scientific support that, is, that it is likely overstated. <coughs> so that's consistent with what we <coughs> see here, that there's a lot of people that have this that don't seem like they've overused something. <coughs> so some causes. Uh, pain on the outside of the elbow can be caused from a number of sources and different reasons. So this is some of the causes as, um, as I see it myself. It's not written in the book, <coughs> but um, our success in treating this here is because we look for what's really unique about each person's condition and really try to address those specific issues um, and not a, it's not the same approach for every person who has a diagnosis of tennis elbow here. So what is it that you have? Finding, out, finding it out requires um, a really thorough history and a thorough exam. So if we look at just one, um, the, the, the basic idea of tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis being the tendonitis um, of the extensor tendons uh, of a forearm, that means the ones that bring it back, uh, clearly from overuse, that's one category. 
There's another category that we're going to call myofascial pain. I'll tell you about that. Nerve pain is another reason to have pain on the outside of your elbow. <coughs> and uh, there can be reasons for a joint problem as well, or a combination of those. So you want to be treated all the same. Um, an important principle, we're, our, our science in physical therapy is the science of movement. And proper movement through the entire body spreads and loads and forces out evenly to reduce and overload phenomena. So here's somebody that you see that is using muscles and tendons that attach in the forearm along the extensors um, mass. Um, and as you see people that are musicians, people in glass blowing, computing. Um, if you ever notice, there are some people that they do activities that really seem to have a lot of repetition, and yet they don't all have repetitive motion problems. Um, I would say notice when you, when you see somebody blowing glass or see someone skiing down uh, the mountain, there are some people you see that they look effortless in their motions, very smooth, very little energy. And there's other people that are doing the same thing, and you can see that it's a lot more effort, a lot more work um, on their part. And so there may be something in that element of what's going on between <coughs> one person having a problem, one person doing a lot of repetition and having no problems at all. So the acute lateral epicondylitis, the extensor tendonitis, the straightforward stuff. So you have no problem. You go out and you rake for uh, the, getting the leaves in for the weekend, and all of a sudden you have a uh, painful elbow. Those things are the straightforward things, the easy things to treat. Relative rest, relative means you don't have to stop doing everything. It means you would want to just reduce activities that don't provoke your symptoms. Put ice on it, and then gradually return to activity as it feels comfortable. That's as straightforward as it is for most things that we have, if it's just a, a first time acute onset of something, um, that our bodies naturally take care of themselves. It doesn't take a lot of sophistication and a lot of um, huge medical care. That's, that's, what, that's what we do. That's the way the body responds. So that's the easy stuff. That's the stuff we don't usually see because people take care of themselves at home and they get over it and it's gone. Um, but what about the people that the pain persists with, or that they didn't do something to bring it on, they just got this elbow pain? Um, understanding something about myofascial trigger point, myofascial pain and trigger points is probably helpful in understanding some differences in, um, in pain around the elbow. So um, Dr. Janet Travell was uh, the physician who worked with John F. Kennedy and uh, wrote this volume of books um, about pain that is caused by muscle uh, regional things. So that's not caused by nerve, it's caused by muscle. And um, what can it be? So uh, her research demonstrated that there's um, a trigger point is an area of hyper irritability. It's usually within a taut band of skeletal muscle um, or in the muscle's connective tissue or fascia. And it's painful in compression when you press on it. And it can give rise to characteristic referred pain, pain away from the place you're pressing on. Tenderness and sometimes an autonomic phenomenon. So an active trigger point is one that has all those characteristics and it, it is just active. You press on it, it's causing pain is what makes it an active trigger point. You can also have a latent trigger point where it has all the characteristics of being tender um, and um, affects muscle length and can result in muscle weakness, but it doesn't cause pain. The latent means what it means. It means it's like, it can be a problem waiting to happen. Um, and uh, trigger points can be activated directly by acute overload. So, you know, you really overdo it one time uh, and it can set it off and create it. Or overwork fatigue, something just persisting over and over and over, overuse. Um, other things, even visceral disease and um, emotional distress or, and, and um, uh, arthritis or other things that could actually stimulate a trigger. So here's one, the extensor carpi radialis longus, big fancy name, but it is um, uh, 
you know, the longest and the brevis are the two muscles that really cock the wrist back that are we're always typically thought of what is the, the, uh, the pain problem. It's the tendon of one of these couple of tendons up here. So you see that um, when that tendon has, uh, um, in this muscle, the trigger point in this muscle shows up as pain around the elbow. So that's common and makes sense with that. Um, there's another muscle, the, the, um, the brachioradialis is a different muscle. It actually does a lot of this motion, not a lot of this motion. It does this. Um, if you can imagine, uh, if you're a carpenter and you're doing a lot of that, you may not have the same thing that's giving you trouble in the same area um, that somebody else does. And so again, you see the, the pain showing up here in the elbow um, and the trigger point is not right where the pain is and it's not where some of the other trigger points are as well. Um, here's elbow pain as well, the ring finger of the extensor. So a muscle group that extends the fingers. Um, this selected one here, uh, especially where the ring finger is, causes elbow pain. Um, there's elbow pain. It's the triceps. It's the triceps being this muscle here. So a gentleman that I had the pleasure to treat this past summer, uh, an attorney uh, who had pain that came on for no apparent reason in December. Then in January, he was doing some shoveling. He was out in Colorado for a little bit where they actually had some snow last year. And uh, shoveled some, it got worse. Um, he wasn't shoveling a lot because he really was back located in our area here and his wife was doing a subspecialty uh, medical residency and his pain persisted and it persisted and it was severe. It was it kept him up at night. He was in charge of the two kids while she was doing a residency and he couldn't care for the kids in the sense of picking up the, the, the small kids and things like that. But you can imagine it's, it's keeping you from sleeping at night. His problem was primarily um, in the triceps. So if you can imagine trying to deal with this problem where you think of it as uh, just the extensor tendons and you're in the wrong area. Um, this gentleman did very well in, in five treatments. Um, you know, it was like, I, I haven't felt this well in months. And um, in the next month he was really doing um, very well, getting ready to head back to Colorado where they were finished the residency and going back. Um, and he's uh, doing exceptionally well. Now the supinator is um, the muscle that would turn the palm up, so that's supination. Um, and that is thought to be one of the main muscles that will cause elbow pain, lateral, outside elbow pain. So again, it's not the same thing, not the same location, not the same kind of activity, but there it is, and that has a trigger point in it, that's where it shows up. Going to see later also. The other thing in this is you see this nerve that runs through this muscle in particular, which can be a problem to cause elbow pain, but it's not primarily muscle. Um, there can also be problems with the joint that create elbow pain, lateral and elbow pain. So, very briefly, if this is a picture of the elbow, if you're looking at the, um, the front of my right elbow here. Um, the small bone on the outside, the small bone up here is the radius, and you can see that it's kind of a knobby thing, the way that the, the one forearm bone um, meets and articulates with that section of the, of the humerus, or the upper arm bone. So surfaces need to move <coughs> in line, congruently. If you can imagine like when you're pulling a drawer out, and the drawer starts to skew a little bit, it starts to jam. The more you pull on it, the more it jams. If you can imagine your elbow, it doesn't take a lot to be going out of line, and then it starts to pinch and it starts to become painful. Uh, it's a matter of getting the joint to move congruently as a way of restoring the, uh, relieving the problem. And that's not necessarily primarily a muscle problem or primarily a nerve problem. So then you can have a nerve problem. So here's the, the radial nerve 
goes through the supinator muscle, and it's one place that it can get entrapped and become a pain problem and have pain on the outside of the elbow. Now, um, nerve has, is really unique. Um, it, it can feel like an ache. It, it can be some burning. Um, people that sell my arm, I just things feel heavy, weak. Um, sometimes that's characteristic of nerve pain. And the thing about ner nerves is that stretching them, they don't like to be stretched and they don't like to be compressed. So a, a very typical thing that we would do for um, helping to regain some flexibility of, of the extensor tendon muscle, muscle tendon unit, would be to stretch it. Now, if this nerve is entrapped there and you're doing this kind of an activity, to, an exercise to stretch it, you're going to be really aggravated in the condition or it's like it's not getting better. And that could be one of the reasons why is because it does not like that. So that's why it's essential to know what you're dealing with, um, if it's nerve or muscle or combination. Um, nerve gliding exercises, which we'll show you what that's like. It's like dental flossing um, or something that might be. Um, and the other thing is about um, if it's nerve there, sometimes a tennis elbow braces can really make things worse as it compresses on it. So you might know somebody that though they swear my tennis elbow brace is really fantastic for me and you might hear somebody else that's like, you know, I've tried that but it does not work for me. It really hurts. It makes it worse. It may be because they have a different issue going on. Uh, just awareness that um, irritation from the neck or the shoulder, if it really heightens the sensitivity of tissue, um, then that can be part of what makes things more reactive and more likely to be a problem. Um, it can also be a source to drive some of uh, creating some myofascial pain. This is up here just simply to show you this is, this is another trigger point from a muscle up in here um, that it's causing pain in the elbow. <coughs> but you're not having any problem in the elbow joint, you're having a problem with this muscle thing up here. And so we also see people that sometimes have, yeah, I got a problem in my neck and my shoulder. Yeah, I got this elbow problem too, this epicondylitis. And um, things become a little murkier, murkier sometimes when there's pain from a lot of different areas. So the combination is that some people don't have just one or just the other. You can have more than one. And it's really important to know what you, what you have in the sense of treating it. <coughs> So with um, treatment, we mentioned uh, earlier that relative rest, ice are very basic things that, that are the right things to do for um, an inflamed condition. Anti-inflammatory medication is really commonly used for this kind of a problem. And I would say, in my own opinion, if, it's, if, if you go out, you rake the leaves, it really gets flared up that weekend, and you're using some anti-inflammatory medication and that takes it right down in a few days and you don't need it, and that's very useful and appropriate use of it. Um, but if you have to keep using it to stay comfortable, not, if your body's not handling it itself, it's like, well, what, you know, what is the problem? And is there something else that really needs to be dealt with instead of, gosh, I just have to have medication or else I can't function? So as far as other kinds of treatments that, that are used, you know, some of the things that we do here, electrical stimulation is a, is a modality that we may use to help calm tissue down, you know, like a, another level of blood using ice. Um, iontophoresis is another electrical um, device that drives medication to the area that we sometimes use to drive um, medication to reduce the inflammation on things. Kinesio tape, if you watch the Olympics, you'll see some pretty fancy stuff. Um, kinesio tape is another thing that we may use. It really helps in um, resting the area, in improving the circulation of the area. And one of the hallmarks that is necessary for us is our manual skills. So soft tissue mobilization or joint mobilization are, are fundamental to most of what we need to do to address fascial components that I pointed out to you, um, that would be um, that would be a way to eliminate the trigger point. 
So if you ever had um, soreness in my in your shoulder up here, yeah, that's I woke up and it's really tight and it's sore, and when I press on it, it's sore, but it feels good. That would be an example of, of, a, of a trigger point kind of effect, and that would be what we would do to work on those selected areas to eliminate the trigger point and the uh, the effect of the trigger. So exercise. Stretching is, um, becomes an important part of restoring the length of the shortened tissue. Um, it's interesting to know if, if people had limited flexibility before the problem began or if it developed after the problem. Because sometimes they come with a history about that. Uh, this is one stretch. This is probably the common one that we think about that stretches out the muscles in the back side of the, the forearm. It's very common really helpful to use. And this is how to demonstrate another one that may stretch some of the supinator muscles. So if that's part of what's tight there, um, and if that's a major part of the problem, that may be an important part of stretching. I mentioned with um, if you have a nerve problem, you may we may want to be doing the nerve <coughs> movements instead of stretching. So say it was the radial nerve through the year, this would make it, potentially make it worse. There's no one muscle that goes the length from here to here, but there is nerve tissue that goes up. So what you're seeing in the example here is um, if you were to bend the wrist this way but bend your neck that way, then you're putting in slack. If you can imagine the nerve <coughs> tissue coming out of the neck and running down the arm, you're pulling it from one end and slackening it from the other. All right, And then you might be tensioning it the other way, but taking the smack off here. And so that's just one example of what we might do and have somebody do as a gliding exercise where the tissue is, we're looking to have it move like this, not by stretching. Uh, as things get calmed down, then restoring the strength is really important. Um, and I think in the gentleman's case, I gave you the example of, he had a history of tennis elbow on both sides like four years before, although it went away. And maybe that was part of a latent problem waiting to happen. <coughs> and interestingly enough, he said, you know, ever since I had that, I've always been careful about, you know, I didn't have, it all went away, but I've always been careful. And so if, if being careful for him meant that he didn't really get back to using his arms, um, then that might be part of the issue. But certainly, um, really rebuilding the strength and resilience was important um, in his case. So these are examples that are very commonly seen of, of uh, strengthening the wrist extensors. If it's really sensitive, we usually start out with isometrics, anything that does not provoke the symptoms, and then go into um, eccentric loading. Eccentric is a word that simply means when you're lowering something down this way as opposed to working so hard to pull it up, it's the lowering it down, slowly and emphasizing that part. So because turning the palm up is supination, and the biceps not only bends the elbow, but it turns the palm up. It's a really powerful one here. That may be an, um, an important exercise in restoring strength, as well as um, resistive supination. So Heidi's just demonstrating using the hammer as a lever to, as resistance to increase strength for that. Weak muscles of the shoulder or the torso can result in strain in the elbow. So, uh, if you probably have muscles like that, you don't need to be doing this. But it's a good example um, that if uh, people are have weakness in another part of their body, then they may be overstraining part of their another section because something's not doing its share. So this is an, ex uh, an example of some of the exercise we might look at and have to do. Bracing can be helpful in, in supporting the area, the idea that it, kind of spreading out the, the surface area of where something is attached to, so it unloads the, the end of it. Um, so they can be effective. We don't like people to necessarily be dependent on that. They don't have to be. Uh, they can really have their body develop its own resources. It's a better situation. Um, ergonomics are important. If you're talking about tennis, racket handle size, the tension on the strings can be things that can contribute to increasing the load. Um, proper tools, you saw the, the picture of the person mousing, and if they're doing this, 
you remember seeing the picture of the, the finger extensors up here, that person's problem may be different than the other, but there's a potential issue that needs to be resolved for that person. Proper efficient movement. So um, my talk is not about injections and surgery. Um, uh, those are separate issues above and beyond. Finish off with that. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. I've had tennis elbow over the years a number of times, and I've been told that it's bursitis, uh, swelling, if you will, of the bursus sac. Did you comment on that? Because you haven't, you didn't mention that at all. Right. Um, uh, the, you know, the bursa is it's fatty tissue that usually is in an area to reduce friction between surfaces. Um, it's, it's, uh, in our experience, it's often common that if you have muscles and tendons around the area, they get inflamed, the bursa may also get inflamed as opposed to the bursa just by itself. <coughs> and then the question is, well, why? I mean, why doesn't it just calm down? Because the body does that when it's given the opportunity in the environment. So I, my question would be, well, what's going on? Is there something that's really not understood that has it persisted? I, I, I would be suspect if it was a bursitis that is just ongoing. If you're if you're not doing something that is intentional, or unintentional, or just every day you're aggravating it and <coughs> never giving it a chance to calm down, which is the story here. I'd be suspect of what the source is.